Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Foley's Latin America Web Conference Series. Today's event is being recorded. I'll turn the conference over to Jackie Polson. Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Latin America Web Conference Series. First, I'd like to go over some housekeeping items. Um, if you could please, if you're having any technical difficulties, please call 1-800-569-3848. For assistance. You can also dial star zero for audio assistance. If you have any questions regarding the web conference, please contact one of your Foley attorneys directly. In order to get the full screen version of today's web conference, please click on the full screen button located above the presentation slides to maximize the presentation. Also, if you would like to download today's presentation, you can click on the Download Files button, which is located to the right of the presentation. We will also apply for CLE credit after the web conference today. If you did not supply your CLE information upon registration, please email it to me, Jackie Polson, which is jpolson at foley.com. For those seeking Kansas New York, and New Jersey CLE credit, you will be required to complete the attorney affirmation form following today's web conference. A four-digit code will be announced during today's presentation. Please email that code to me again at jpolson at foley.com to receive a copy of the form, or you may download the file directly, again, to the right of today's presentation. Thank you and enjoy today's web conference. I will now turn it over to Francisco Cerezo. Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning, depending on where you're, uh, or good evening, depending on where you're logging in from. Thanks for joining us. Again, this is Francisco Cerezo. Very happy that you joined. This is the first of a series of webinars which we anticipate we'll be doing on a quarterly basis. Uh, among the subjects that we'll be doing in the future will be things related to whether it's immigration, uh, trends in lending and cross-border financing, and a series of other in, uh, topics that I think could be of interest to some or all of you, so we'll keep you posted as we do future webinars. For this one, we thought it would be particularly interesting for our inaugural webinar, if you will, we thought it'd be particularly interesting uh, to do FCPA. As clearly you're all aware, uh, it's a growing trend. Uh, there's been a lot more FCPA enforcement. Not only uh, are we seeing in the companies that are very active uh, in Latin America, U.S. companies very active in Latin America, but we've seen how it actually extends to companies from Latin America with, ve with very little ties to the United States who see themselves impacted by FCPA. Uh, so for that, I, we, I, I thought it would be terrific if my colleague, partner, and friend Jaime Guerrero uh, would uh, do the presentation today. Jaime is uh, one of the partners in our government enforcement compliance and white collar group. He's a former federal prosecutor as an assistant U.S. attorney, and he focuses primarily on FCPA matters, uh, all sorts of white collar matters, but he's, uh, over the last five years in particular, he's become particularly active in the FCPA space, both on the compliance as well as the defense front. Uh, representing clients at, before SEC and the DOJ. Um, Jaime, uh, for those of you who eventually may want to send some questions online, feel free to send the questions in Spanish since Jaime is fully bilingual, but the presentation will be in English as are the materials. But if you want to email any questions uh, for us, for Jaime to try to address them during the last five to ten minutes uh, of a Q&A, uh, we'd be happy to, you know, if you send the questions in Spanish, that's perfectly fine. The webinar, today's webinar will be approximately one hour, uh, so hopefully it will be short and sweet. So with that said, and no, without further ado, Jaime, please. Francisco, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and early good evening for everyone else on the phone uh, and, and watching on the, online. Uh, what I'd like to do really is go over um, anti-corruption and compliance issues in Latin America. Uh, Francisco, Francisco Correct has become a, a, a major focus for those who've been following the FCPA and anti-corruption issues around the world. Uh, you're seeing really that both the, the, the trend of increased enforcement has not stopped, uh, and more, more importantly for those practicing in Latin America, uh, the focus on Latin America is only increasing. Uh, what I have before you right now is an outline of what we'll be covering today. Uh, overall, the FCPA enforcement activity, 
the basics of the FCPA, um, other regimes around the world that have anti-corruption uh, laws in place that we should focus on briefly. And finally, um, what's important for, for those who are practicing and, and either in-house counsel or advising counsel, uh, in-house counsel is, is corruption, um, anti-corruption compliance issues, things to be aware of and look into um, when you're dealing with the, with the FCPA or their anti -corruption, other anti-corruption uh, regimes. So what I've done is presented, it, it's a chart uh, prepared by other firms and, and really it's just a summary of, of the DOJ and the SEC actions, the enforcement activity. And what you're seeing, if, you, if you're looking at this, is obviously there was a huge spike in 2010 uh, of, of uh, enforcement activity, which really resolved around a few cases. But overall, beginning in 2004 through the present, you're seeing a steady increase of both SEC and DOJ enforcement. Um, as of this, this halfway through the year, uh, we are already past, at least in terms of DOJ enforcement activity, more than all of last year. And the SEC is tra uh, trailing a bit, a bit behind last year, uh, but they're usually following what the, FC, what, uh, the DOJ does, so that's not unusual. Um, in addition, what I want to do is give a brief overview of some of the t top FCPA-related monetary settlements. And the reason why I wanted to do this was to give you an idea of how large these settlements are coming in at. Now, obviously, uh, the reason for a settlement, for example, with uh, for certain companies is because there's allegations of wrongdoing, they want to resolve. Some companies won't want to take a risk of going to trial. But ultimately, what we're looking at for some of these very large corporations are settlements in the range of $100 million all the way up to $800 million. And um, that trend of large settlements, uh, including penalties, disgorgement, fines, is not going to end. And in fact, there are people who are saying that at least some of the current investigations being conducted by the DOJ and the SEC will dwarf uh, the most recent settlement, by, uh, or the largest settlement so far by Siemens in 2008, as well as the $600 million settlement by Halliburton. Of importance is you know where is the FC, FCP enforcement um, activity being conducted right now? Where is the DOJ and the SEC looking? And here it's just a highlight of some of the countries where there's been investigations that have been disclosed by the DOJ and the SEC. And as you can see, looking at um, the chart, there are a number of Latin American countries that are on here, including Argentina, Brazil, Costa Rica, uh, Mexico, and. It's important to note that this is a, just a summary. It doesn't include all the countries. But what we've seen, for those of the practice in this field that are doing FCPA enforcement, whether it's defending corporation or conducting internal investigations, um, as well as representing individuals or just working on compliance for companies, we're seeing a very large focus uh, or an increased focus by the DOJ and SEC on Latin America. Uh, China is still of importance to them, as is India, but uh, Brazil, uh, Mexico, and other countries throughout Latin America are really becoming a focus for uh, the DOJ and the SEC. One thing to note, one thing that the DOJ and the SEC look at, um, and you've probably seen this before if you're on this phone call, you may not have, um, Transparency International, a, a third party uh, organization, does this up. Uh, this, this uh, index of a corruption perception index, what they view as being the most corrupt countries, not what actually is corrupt, but how it's being perceived by outsiders. Why is this important? It's important because at least for the perspective of the DOJ and the SEC, when they're looking at certain entities in certain parts of the world, one of the things they focus on is, is that a country where there's rampant corruption, at least a perception of rampant corruption? Uh, what's important here for, for our purposes is looking at the, the darker red a color is, the more likely or the higher corruption perception index it's going to be, uh, uh, and the, high, the higher corruption has a lower score. And I will go over some scores. This is an example of some of the Latin American countries and where they, where they uh, rank. What's considered the most corrupt country in Latin America? Uh, again, this is just a perception, not that it's actually corrupt, but the perception from the DOJ, the SEC, other countries of what's, what they consider to be corrupt countries, Venezuela ranks the top uh, with a score of 19. Uh, the, the lower the score, uh, it's more likely the more corrupt of a country it is, at least in perception. Uh, examples, again, Mexico, score of 34, ranks out of 174 countries, 105. Uh, and, and there are some countries down here that actually do very well. Chile actually has a 
better ranking than the United States. It has a score of 72. It ranks 20 out of 174, meaning that there's only 19 more countries that are, that are viewed as being less corrupt than, than uh, Chile. Uh, so we, we give these rankings as just an idea of what happens when the DOJ and the SC begin doing an investigation. They get a tip, for example, from someone in Argentina. They'll look at this and say, okay, Argentina is a relatively, at least according to the perception, corrupt country. So they'll make, take it more seriously than they would a tip from, let's say, Chile or Costa Rica where the corruption index is not as bad. Um, but this is something that the DOJ and the SC do factor in and into. And one of the things that we do, and we'll touch on this a little later, dealing with compliance issues, when we're dealing with companies in, in, uh, in the U.S. or companies outside the U.S. that have that want to put a compliance program in place is rating and uh, helping to prepare compliance uh, uh, programs that actually effectively take into account the, the corruption perception index um, that, that Transparency International puts out. So again, dealing with Latin America, some of the FCPA enforcement activity that we wanted to focus on and give you some ideas of what's been happening. Um, again, the number of FCPA prosecution with the Latin American component is increasing. Uh, and this is give us an indication that government regulators are taking a hard look at alleged violations of the FCPA in Latin America. Uh, in 2010, 2011, 32% uh, of the cases uh, that DOJ disclosed had a Latin American component, with affected countries including but not limited to Argentina, Brazil, Costa Rica, Honduras, Mexico, Nicaragua. And this is just the ones that are disclosed, that, where there has actually been a settlement. This does not include the number of matters that are not disclosed, that are, for example, under investigation, because the DOJ and the SC do not disclose who or what they're investigating. Um, general rule of thumb for those that practice this area is that, for example, if for every one investigation that's disclosed, there are six or seven that are not being disclosed that are outstanding that are the government's investigating, either DOJ, DOJ or the SEC or combined investigating in certain countries. Some of the more recent uh, FCPA enforcement, we want to touch on these. One was uh, BizJet International. It was charged in 2012 with bribing Mexican, Panamanian, and Brazilian government officials from 2004 to 2010 to obtain aircraft maintenance contracts. The officials demanded bribes, including cash payments of between $30,000 to $40,000, asked commissions for awarding of the contracts to BizJet. Um, what's important here is that many of the bribes were paid through a shell company. And we'll touch on this a little later when we talk about third-party agents and, and risk associated with that. Uh, but using a shell company to become a very common way for bribes to be paid uh, uh, that could violate the FCPA or that would violate the FCPA or other anti-corruption regimes. Um, ultimately, BizJet paid an $11.8 million criminal penalty in exchange for a deferred prosecution agreement. Uh, the voluntary disclosure and cooperation was noted in reducing the penalty, so that was actually a reduction given the fact that BizJet fully disclosed their, uh, what they had found um, and worked with the government to try to come to a resolution. There were also BizJet executives that were charged. Uh, and they were sentenced up to eight months of home detention in exchange for cooperating with the DOJ and the SEC uh, and coming to a resolution to, to resolve this uh, FCPA enforcement action. Many of you probably heard of the Walmart Stores, Inc. Uh, investigation that's being conducted by the DOJ and the SEC. Uh, last year, there was a couple of articles that came out in the New York Times that disclosed um, the alleged violations in Mexico. Uh, and um, Walmart itself has now disclosed an internal investigation that's being conducted regarding um, Mexico and the procurement of licenses and permits to build and construct stores uh, uh, in Mexico. The alleged bribes include approximately, approximately $8.5 million in cash payments to third-party agents who purportedly kept a percentage and passed the remainder on to government officials. This is all allegations only. There's been no uh, findings. There's been no settlement. Um, this is just what's been disclosed by Walmart Stores, Inc. Um, and of the more most recent uh, Form 10-K that was uh, filed by Walmart, they reported $157 million spent in uh, fiscal year 2012 in professional fees and expenses related to the FCP investigation and compliance. Uh, that's just for one year. That's just the legal expenses, uh, professional expenses. In the first quarter of 2000, uh, 2014, which would have been the February through uh, April period of this year, 
uh, I believe they reported close to $70 million in professional fees and expenses as part of this investigation. Uh, the investigation is ongoing and has expanded to Brazil, India, and China. And what's, the reason why we bring this up, obviously there's been no finding, there's been no resolution of Walmart Stores, Inc., but what's important is to think these are just allegations. There's been no findings yet. And what Walmart has had to spend just to investigate and put in a corporate co in, in, uh, uh, compliance program in place or update their compliance program is significant. And the costs associated with that aren't just monetary, but it's also time where the company has to focus on um, dealing with these issues instead of running a business. Uh, more recently, uh, uh, one that was settled, Ralph Lauren, uh, the apparel maker and designer, uh, settled a case based on allegations in Argentina, uh, specifically from 2005 to 2009. Uh, the Argentinian subsidiary paid customs, uh, a customs broker approximately $568,000, which was used to bribe customs officials. Uh, in addition, they gave customs officials gifts, including perfume, handbags, dresses, etc. Uh, the bribes were used to facilitate the importation of prohibited merchandise into Argentina without inspection. Moreover, the bribes were invoiced as loading and delivery expenses, and thus were considered a books and records violation issue, which we'll discuss in a second when we deal with the, what exactly is the FCPA and how is it violated. Um, ultimately, Ralph Lauren uh, paid fines of approximately $1.6 million as part of a non-prosecution agreement with the DOG and the SEC. The agreements noted extensive cooperation and assistance in the investigation and increased compliance programs on a global level. So a big part of this is, again, Ralph Lauren going, explaining to the DOJ what they'd found and the SEC what they'd tell them what they found, and working with the government to come to a resolution to minimize the risk of a, of a larger penalty or potential indictment of the company. Another recent uh, uh, settlement, OrthoFix International, um, from approximately 2003, 2010, a Mexican subsidiary of Ortho International bribed Mexican officials to obtain and retain sales contracts with the Instituto Mexicano de Seguro Social, the Institute of Social Security in Mexico, with total bribes of approximately $317,000. It was resolved in 2012 with, 2000, with total fines and penalties uh, in the DOJ and SEC actions of approximately $7.4 million. So what is the FCPA? Uh, for a number of you, you may have not had a chance to touch on this matter yet. For some of you, it's, it's going to be uh, something you've heard before. But we, would, we did want to go over some of the basics, what the probations are, what the prohibitions are on the essential elements. So the FCPA has two main components. The first is the obvious anti-bribery provision. This is the one where essentially, and we'll go over in a second, is you cannot bribe a government official or a foreign official um, or a third party who's going to bribe a foreign official in order to obtain or retain business. Uh, the second applies only to issuers, and that deals with the books and records and internal controls provisions. And again, we'll go over that in a minute. Uh, and that's what we, when I mentioned earlier, the Ralph Lauren um, uh, matter and how they, you know, the, the expenses were put off as uh, um, uh, importation and delivery fees, things of that nature, when they were trying to hide the bribes, that would consider, be considered a books and records uh, violation. So the anti-bribery provisions apply to domestic concerns, that's private companies, LLCs, et cetera, and U.S. citizens, issuers, basically public companies who have to report to the SEC, and any person who, while in the U.S., commits an improper act, including non-U.S. citizens, and it also covers payments made by third parties with knowledge that the payment would be used to fund FCPA illegal activity. And we'll go over in a minute what, what, how the third parties come into play here uh, when we're dealing with the FCPA and anti-bribery provisions. And it has extraterritorial jurisdiction, meaning that the, the, the uh, DOJ and the SEC view their, their ability to to extradite individuals and to, to charge companies extraterritorially with a very broad expanse. They look at it as if, if there's any touching on the U.S., whether it's a simple bank account, a mail drop here in the U.S., that, at least according to the DOJ and the SEC, can be considered as giving them jurisdiction. And we'll go over that in a few minutes as well. So what exactly is prohibited by the FCPA? It is paying or offering to pay anything of value directly or indirectly, to a foreign official or to any other person while knowing 
that all or part of the thing of value we paid or offered to a foreign official. Corruptly, for the purpose of influencing the official in some official act or to secure any improper advantage in order to obtain or retain business. So this is, what has, this is what's prohibited by the FCPA. And we'll go over some of the bolded items, for example, to anything of value for an official and what it means to obtain or retain business uh, to discuss a little more in depth what the FCPA does. So what is anything of value? Some of the examples given here include cash, cash equivalent, gifts, travel expenses and or pay, payment of personal expenses, services, golf outings or other entertainment, charitable donations in some cases, medical treatment, loans, jobs for relatives. And, and just for a, a point of knowledge for those on the phone, uh, the examples here are all for matters that we've actually dealt with. We've dealt with uh, individual, you know, in foreign officials seeking jobs for relatives, uh, seeking charitable donations for uh, organization where they're either the members of or can funnel money themselves, uh, as well as travel expenses and gifts. We don't see as much the actual payment of cash or cash equivalent, but it still does occur. Uh, last year, in fact, uh, we dealt with an investigation where one of our large clients, they were directly paying a for, former foreign official 10% of all of their invoices uh, on a contract they won with a, uh, with a government agency uh, in Mexico. What is or who is a foreign official? It's any officer or employee of a foreign government or any department, agency, or instrumentality thereof. The DOJ interprets instrumentality include employees of state-owned or controlled even assuming the, 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 the greatest expanse of the DOJ's view on this, a janitor in the building. Um, there is no distinction. The DOJ uh, makes it very clear that if it's a foreign official um, or any employee of one of these state-owned enterprises, that's sufficient to be considered a foreign official. There is a, a case that's being litigated right now before the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, appeals where the foreign official challenge is, is pending. Uh, essentially, uh, that def a defendant there was convicted of, of uh, uh, on premise, convicted based on, prem on bribes paid to employees of Haiti Telco, a state-owned telephone utility, and the question there that is being presented before the Court of Appeals, which will be the first time any appellate court decides this issue, is who is or what is a foreign official, uh, because as right now there is no there is no uh, parameters being drawn up besides those being given by the DOJ. So they are considered, they are first off making a decision who is a, f a foreign official uh, and, and litigating that um, and making decisions based on that. So ultimately, we believe the court is going to make a decision here on what exactly is a foreign official uh, and that will uh, give at least some clarity for the practitioner to figure out, you know, is this, is this employee of a state or entity enough or is it really just for the traditional foreign officials who work for government agencies? And the last portion of it is the, the idea of making a payment or bribe with the, with the, uh, to obtain or retain business. Um, and there's a business purpose test that we look at. Um, so it includes any payment related to the renewal of contracts, the execution or performance of contracts, or the retention of existing business. Examples from the DOJ and the SEC, winning a contact, contract, excuse me, influencing the procurement process, circumventing import rules, gaining access to non-public bid tender information, evading taxes or penalties, influencing enforcement actions or litigation, and obtaining exceptions to regulations. These are all considered examples of efforts by companies to bribe in order to obtain or retain business. So it's obviously not traditionally, not just the idea of, of, of winning a contract, that's obviously the first one, but every other one of these is considered by the DOJ and SC as an attempt to obtain or retain business. A, a common question is, uh, especially for those entities that are outside the United States, uh, who, who, are, who don't really have much of a footprint in the U.S. and are operating just in Latin America or other parts of the world, is when is it the DOJ, when, when am I under jurisdiction of the SEC or the DOJ? I touched on it briefly earlier, 
regarding what the DOJ and SEC's view of the jurisdiction is. Um, but the, the reality is it, it, the DOJ and SEC have taken such an expansive view of jurisdiction under the FCPA that for those of us, when we have to rep talk to clients and give them recommendations, you do a more thorough analysis of what really are the contacts with the U.S. and, and that, that might give rise to jurisdiction. But you know, party subjects to the FCPA, again, include domestic concerns and U.S. persons, including U.S. subsidiaries of foreign corporations. So for example, if a corporation incorporated in Argentina, they have a very small subsidiary in the U.S., uh, that, at least according to the DOJ and the SEC, is sufficient for a jurisdiction. Obviously, it includes, as I mentioned earlier, issuers, officers, directors, employees, or agents of an issuer domestic concern, uh, and any person that violates the FCPA within the territory of the United States. And again, this sort of covered what we discussed earlier, but what's important here is understanding that, as I mentioned, because there's really no defined case law yet, for practitioners, when we're dealing with this, the idea is really to look and see what is the DOJ and the SC looking at. We've had matters where, for example, a client in Argentina or a client in, in Colombia, all they have in the United States is a bank account or a mail drop, um, and they use that to funnel payments from third parties in other parts of the world. Those payments alone, at least according to the DOJ and the SC, is sufficient to give rise to jurisdiction. In addition, jurisdiction based on acts committed on U.S. soil is the obvious um, uh, reason for jurisdiction by the DOJ. So, for example, if any part of the uh, conspiracy, relevant parts of the conspiracy take place on U.S. soil, that's sufficient to raise jurisdiction in the U.S. Also, based it, uh, banks or wire transfers uh, to make a, a payment to a foreign official or to a third party that's going to pay a foreign official, that would be sufficient for jurisdiction, at least according to the DOJ and the SEC. Again, this has not been yet challenged. For those challenges that are still pending, um, that we, we do expect clarity by the courts in the future. But as of, at least as of right now, looking at this as we speak, um, these are the kind of things that can uh, raise jurisdiction. Uh, we give two examples here, Panalpina and Halliburton KBR. These are uh, uh, two different matters where there was uh, settlements by the SEC and DOJ with these entities. And in some cases, the actual jurisdiction, how they raised jurisdiction, was very convoluted. Uh, it could have been as simple as having a, a, uh, a, uh, um, having a, a payment that, was got, that, that went through um, the U.S., or for example, even just having a, uh, a subsidiary here in the U.S. for a foreign entity, the U.S. would take a, a view that yes, this is a this is going to be a um, give you give us jurisdiction to go after the company outside the U.S. So there are exceptions and affirmative defenses to the FCPA. For example. If something is permitted under local law, written local law, that would be an affirmative defense. However, there's, there's, a, there's two things to look into here. One is custom is not the same as written laws and regulations. So if it's customary to be able to pay a bribe in order to get something done in a certain country, that may be customary in a local country, but it's not the same as a written law or regulation and thus doesn't give an affirmative defense to any violations. Having done this for a long, as long as I've been doing it, I can tell you there's no written law anywhere in the world or regulation that permits payments to foreign officials to obtain or retain business. The other form of defense is facilitating payments. Uh, for example, the emerging best practices the is the, prohibit prohibit the prohibition of uh, facilitating payments, except where the health and safety of an employee is involved. And when we mean facilitating payments, we mean the and the way the DOJ and the SEC look at it is it's a giving the five dollars to a clerk to, to expedite something uh, in cash. You give a five dollar. It's a small amount. Uh, no one would really ever consider that as being the, the deal breaker or, or the deal maker for a, for a company that's trying to do business in a certain country. Um, and, and there is an exception to that and a firmer defense within the FCPA. But really what ends up happening is as practitioners and we counsel clients, 
and basically tell them that you should just prohibit it. There shouldn't be facilitating payments because it is a slippery slope. The question becomes, when does one facilitate, facilitating payment become a number of facilitating payments that ultimately becomes a large amount that can be considered a bribe to expedite or, or conduct business in a third world country or in a, third, in a country outside the U.S.? Another uh, exception or affirmative defense are when you're paying reasonable and bona fide expenditures uh, directly related to the promotion or demonstration of product or services or a negotiation, execution, or performance of a contract. Examples include travel and expenses uh, to visit company facilities, travel and expenses for training, travel and expenses for meetings, Oh, before I go, sorry. Um, and, and what's important here, again, is understanding what it is that a company can and can't do. And this is something that a company should have in, on their, uh, in their compliance, uh, cor their corporate compliance, dealing with uh, anti-corruption. Um, for example, we get asked this all the time, and I got a call last week regarding a client who wanted to invite a foreign official to come visit their factory, get exception to it as long as, again, the expenses are reasonable and they're bona fide, you're really doing this uh, for, the, for, for the benefit of the company. The question becomes what becomes beyond that, what, what you offer beyond that. For example, paying for the hotel, okay. Paying for a very expensive dinner somewhere that has nothing to do with the business, probably not okay. Paying for, paying for them to pay, play golf, not okay. Paying for them to visit the facility, um, you know, taking a taxi there, probably okay. But those are the kind of fine level detail points that an anti-corruption compliance program should have in place. Here we just have some of the, the penalties for violating anti-bribery provisions. What's important to know here is for the FCPA, there are criminal penalties, civil penalties, as well as disgorgement that could be authorized. Um, and the penalties, uh, at least for individuals, while the maximums for each violation is up to five years, there are people who've been sentenced for significantly longer than that for violations of the FCPA. Um, and, and as we've already noted, the the uh, Penalties, in terms of criminal penalties and the, the fines, have reached into the hundreds of millions of dollars and are probably going to go into the billions in the not too distant future. So these are just examples of what, what uh, can be considered penalties for or will be considered penalties for FCPA violations of the anti-bribery provisions. Um, the second prong of the FCPA deals with the overview of accounting and internal control provisions. Uh, this is a other method of violating the FCPA, this is not the payment of the cash. It's how importantly how it's recorded, how, let's say, bribes are recorded, um, and how, if, if the books and records of a company are, are up to date and correct. Um, this only applies to issuers. It only applies to publicly traded companies or companies which have reporting requirements with the SEC. Um, so for the obvious companies here in the U.S., any Fortune 500 company that has to report to the SEC with their 10 Qs or 10 Ks, that would be... Um, a company that would be an issuer. Less obvious is a company that's not a report. It doesn't. Uh, it's not a U.S.-based company, but they're a foreign company, and that foreign company um, has stocks in that foreign company's stock exchanges. But they have to report here because they sell, for example, um, American depository receipts (ADRs). That could lead rise to jurisdiction um, under the idea of being an issuer. So, for issuers, they must maintain accurate books and records that reflect in reasonable detail, accurately and completely, transactions and asset dispositions. Must establish effective systems of internal accounting controls. Uh, they, have to have, they have to use a GAAP standard. And the accounting of controls apply to foreign affiliates and joint venture partners depending on the issuer's voting power. And more importantly, you don't need an evidence of a bribe in order for a books and records violation to occur. Um, unrecorded facilitating payment will violate the books and record provision of the FCPA even though they qualify under exemption in the anti-bribery section of the FCPA. Um, and we'll touch on this in a second, but uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of the reasons why Ralph Lauren was charged, and one of the, the basis for the, the, the charges as a books and records violation, was because they didn't record in their accounting records that the bribe being paid was a bribe. They called it something else. So. Not only was it a, uh, a violation of the anti-bribe provision because they paid a bribe, 
but it was also a violation of the accounting controls, accounting control control provision because they didn't accurately reflect that it was a bribe that was being paid. And again, here there are both criminal and civil penalties uh, for the business entities, uh, up to $25 million per violation, um, and the individuals, you know, up to 20 years for viol willful violations in prison. Uh, and civil penalties ranging up to $500,000, uh, both for companies and individuals, so up to $50,000. So what are some of the common issues that we see when we're dealing with the uh, FCPA? Uh, one of them is the, the perils of hosting customer visits. Uh, we put out here some pictures some, uh, to give you an idea of the uh, flavor of the kind of things we deal with on a regular basis. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, companies may provide meals and entertainment if in good faith, without corrupt intent, and with no expectation of a favor. It must be directly related to legitimate business purpose, must be reasonable in value. Some of the best practices include that they should be in accordance with generally accepted business standards. Never should uh, somebody give cash or cash equivalents. Whenever there's going to be a gift, meal, or entertainment, company personnel should be in attendance. And obviously, it should always be properly documented. Not too long ago, uh, the DOJ and the SEC released uh, a joint book regarding uh, the SCPA, the SCPA Resource Guide, where they give some a little more clear guidance on, on the SCPA and how it should be uh, viewed by both companies as, as well as practitioners, in-house counsel. And as they note, and this is a, a quote from the, the Resource Guide, a small gift or token of esteem or gratitude is often an appropriate way for business people to display respect for each other. Some hallmarks of appropriate gift giving are when the gift is given openly and transparently, properly recorded in the giver's books and records, provided only to reflect esteem or gratitude, and permitted under local law. So for those, those of you who deal with this in terms of having uh, uh, clients uh, or cut either as in-house counsel, having these uh, p p policies in place, some of the questions to ask that should be in is the entire trip for the purpose of promoting the company's products or services or in connection with the execution or performance of a contract? Are the proposed expenses proportionate and reasonable in relation to the company's business purpose for inviting the foreign officials? How are the foreign officials' expenses being paid? And who within the company is approving the trip? Is that person sensitive to FCPA issues? Uh, and some of these things, again, we get content, we get calls from clients all the time asking, can we do this? Can we do that? Um, is this an issue? And, and some of the examples I can give that both from cases as well as some of the, the questions we've been asked, uh, we had one client contact and say, look, we want to bring in this foreign official, uh, but this foreign official wants to stay for two extra days um, and go visit, do some, you know, exploring and, and, and sightseeing and basically being a tourist in uh, New York City. Is that allowed? And the answer is it's allowed so long as we're not the ones paying for it. You are not the ones paying for it. If the foreign official on his, in his or her own dime wants to pay to, to visit New York um, outside of what you pay to have that person come to New York um, to visit um, your factories and it was a legitimate you know, visit, then it's allowed. Um, otherwise, you have to be very careful. Um, oh, and the last thing I failed to uh, note is that all the expenses actually described and recorded on the company's books and records. And, and again, what's, here, what's important here is that it's not prohibited. You can bring representatives from other agencies or government agencies or foreign officials to the U.S. or to your facilities around the world as long as it's reasonable and it's done openly and nothing is being given in addition to what is, what is uh, 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 reasonable and bona fide under the circumstances. Another common issue, uh, third-party intermediaries. And this is something that many companies who deal uh, with affiliates around the world have to deal with them on a regular basis. So what's important here is that the FCPA expressly prohibits improper payments made through third parties. So the idea, and, and believe it or not, there were companies that thought that it, as long as they didn't pay it directly, and it was paid to a third party who would make payments to foreign officials, that they would be immunized. That, uh, using the third party does not immunize a company. And in fact, um, one of the big issues for and if you look at most of the FCPA settlements over the past few years, the vast majority of them have at their core the use of third parties uh, in the payment of the bribes um, to the foreign officials. 
As I mentioned, the majority of recent enforcement actions have involved improper payments made through third parties. And importantly, the regulators do not need to prove that a third party acted on the company's direct orders or even that a company actually knew the intermediary, enga intermediary engaged in prohibitive conduct. Most enforcement actions have involved allegations of actual knowledge, however, but willful blindness constitutes knowledge according to the DOJ and the SEC. Recent case by the Eli Lilly in 2012 that was settled. This makes a publicly available information. Uh, Eli Lilly paid a $29 million settlement to the SEC based on allegations of various payments made by agents and distributors in China, Russia, Brazil, and Poland. According to the SEC, Eli Lilly and its subsidiaries possessed a check-the-box mentality when it came to third-party due diligence. Companies can't simply rely on paper-thin assurances by employees, distributors, or customers. They need to look at the surrounding circumstances of any payment to adequately assess whether it could wind up in a government official's pocket. Um, and again, here the idea being Lilly was making payments to these agent distributors, which were not their, their affiliates or subsidiaries. These were third parties. And the payments made to these agents and distributors made their way to foreign officials in China, Russia, Brazil, and Poland. Another matter um, that was settled in 2012 by Oracle, they paid $2 million to the SEC in a settlement uh, based on uh, its subsidiary and distributor in, in, in uh, India. Interestingly, one of the few cases where there's absolutely no allegations of bribes that were actually paid. Um, instead, what the SEC um, based their settlement on was that Oracle and its India subsidiary had a slush fund that could have been used to pay bribes. And that was enough, at least according to the SEC, to trigger Oracle to enter into settlement uh, to resolve a matter of uh, potential FCP violations. So when engaging third parties, some of the things that uh, we tell companies and our clients to look into, any appropriate due diligence inquiry to expose any potential red flags. Uh, success of due diligence should be risk-based. Um, and what I mean by that is the amount of due diligence being performed by either a U.S. or a foreign company into it when they're entering into a joint venture or engaging a third party, uh, it should be risk-based. The amount of due diligence done in, for example, Chile, where there's low risk or at least perception of corruption in those countries, versus the amount being done, let's say, in Mexico that has a higher perception of corruption, should be should be taken into account. Should be risk-based. Um, and any relationship with a third party should be memorialized in writing, and the contract should include anti-corruption reps and warranties, and if possible, audit rights of the third party to make sure that what they're doing is appropriate and not in violation of the FCPA or any other anti-corruption laws. All payment mechanisms, payments should be transparent and traceable. There should be no cash being paid to these third parties. It should always be done through banks, bank accounts, uh, with wire transfers or checks to, get to document what's being done. And all commissions and payments should be reasonable and customary. Um, again, I give an example of, a, one of at least one of our clients that was making payments to a foreign official. They were paying 10% of each monthly's invoice to this former foreign official who, who uh, uh, was now a third party they were using. Um, and it really, there was no real basis for that 10% payment other than just to give this person um, a payment of bribes. So the following due diligence is advised when we're dealing with companies and we're telling them what they should put in their anti-corruption policy procedures and their due diligence um, for third parties. There should be a, a background check. When you're dealing with a third party that's going to be large and doing constant work for you, uh, giving those third parties FCPA training and knowing that they certify that they have taken the training, the third party should sign a certificate that they will comply um, with anti-corruption and FCPA laws, that there will be an FCPA provision of third parties' contracts, that they uh, fill out questionnaires attached to the FCPA policy, including providing references and detailed information about their business, representation and warranties that foreign agents are not owned or controlled by a foreign agent, and that no foreign official holds an ownership interest in it, and also an annual certification of compliance with the FCPA by the foreign agent. The compliance representatives will decide what paperwork should or needs to be filled out and whether or not that vendor is a risk. So again, these are the, the, the two diligence we're advising here that we're giving you as, as, as an idea. They are um, things that we often tell companies that they should put into. You don't need to do all of these for each instance. It depends, again, 
which country you're operating in, um, and what the risk is in those countries. Some of the third-party red flags, things to look at when you're dealing with third parties and red flags, um, excessive commissions, unreasonably large discounts that are being given, consulting agreements that include only vaguely described services, a third party is in a different line of business than that for which it was engaged. A third party is related to or closely tied to a government official. A third party became involved at the express request of the foreign official. A third party is a shell corporation incorporated in an offshore jurisdiction. And a third party requests payment to offshore bank accounts. These are some of the things that if you, if you have these types of red flags that come up, a little more due diligence and a little more care should be taken when dealing with these third parties. Before I go on to the next topic, I'd like to now um, uh, discuss, the, uh, give those uh, individuals who are participating the four-digit code for CLE for Kansas, New York, and New Jersey. The, the code that you need to enter and, and, and use is K0GQ. Again, K0GQ. Some of the common issues dealing with um, mergers and acquisitions. First of all, many recent FCP enforcement actions arose in the context of an M&A due diligence. So a company in the U.S. or outside the U.S. is interested in purchasing a company, they're doing due diligence, and as part of the due diligence for the merger and acquisition, they find issues with the FCPA. Uh, a recent one, Pfizer in 2012 disclosed a settlement uh, with the DOJ and the SEC. Um, and again, here, the importance of pre-acquisition due diligence. Um, there was no attribution, this is regarding uh, uh, Pfizer's purchase of uh, Wyatt, and uh, there was no attribution that Pfizer did anything wrong, um, and that no, no was there consideration that Pfizer was, was responsible for this, but uh, the view was that, um, that uh, Wyatt's pre, uh, Pharmacia's, I'm sorry, pre-acquisition conduct was enough to give rise to Pfizer's liability. Um, and here, the difference being that Pfizer's extensive reviews and its efforts to integrate Wyeth into Pfizer's internal controls gave them the view that there was something wrong, and they did more investigation and found uh, the violations. And they reported it promptly. And again, use of a risk-based approach to due diligence, uh, from, and here, from the Wyeth transaction. The DOJ's apparent recognition that companies have limited resources and that extensive due diligence may not always be appropriate it reemphasized re the importance of a basic FCPA risk assessment when conducting a merger or acquisition. Um, and again, this is purely a, what, what they were. What, uh, Pfizer did was a risk-based uh, review. That's what we recommend to clients. You don't have to always do a full compliance review of every single thing that's ever happened with a, a, a target for a merger and acquisition. It should be risk-based, but there should be something done uh, and during the M&A. So, what should be included as part of the due diligence? It should include a, an evaluation of a target compliance program, evaluation of contractual arrangements with third parties, evaluation of the contracts, evaluation of the distributor and joint venture agreements, and importantly, if any red flags do come up during the due diligence, that those red flags be followed up on, um, not basically just papering them over and saying you know, there, there's nothing here. Um, as, you know, the due diligence should include all of these things no matter where, you're, where, the, where the acquisition is going to take place. Now, again, we, we view it as a risk base. Some, sometimes the, du, the due diligence is much greater than it otherwise would be in, in certain countries, uh, but there should always be due diligence during the M&A process. Um, in addition, there should be plans to integrate compliance programs. So if the uh, acquiree um, does not have a strong compliance program and the acquirer does, the acquirer should make sure that the acquiree, the company they're acquiring or merging with, integrates into the, the, the better compliance program and a stronger compliance program. Uh, always look beyond the target's financial statements. The existence of an improper payment, even prior to the effective date of the agreement, can expose the acquiring or partnering company to enforcement action based upon knowledge and benefit from past payments. So for example, if payments were, there was a payments to a foreign official or to a uh, a third party to a foreign official in 2008, um, and it was a large payment, and it went on for, let's say, a year. As the acquirer, if you're still benefiting from those payments, that's enough to be considered a potential violation of the FCPA by the acquirer because they're uh, obtaining benefit from the past payments and they were aware of it based on their due diligence. 
in a, a DOJ FCPA opinion released in 2008, established some of the best practices for due diligence steps. And for joint ventures, some of the common issues that we look at uh, and we, we advise uh, our, our clients, whether they're, again, U.S.-based or non-U.S.-based, if an issuer owns more than 50% of the voting power of an affiliate or joint venture entity, it must cause such an affiliate joint venture entity to maintain internal accounting controls. If it owns less than 50%, 50% or less of the voting power of an affiliate JV, it must make a good faith effort to cause such affiliate JV entity to maintain internal accounting controls. Of importance, though, if an issuer has effective control via management structure of a joint venture, it is treated as if it owns more than 50% of the voting power. So a company can only have, let's say, 40% or 35% of, the, control of uh, the voting power, but if they have effective control of the management, that's considered as enough to consider over 50% of the voting power. As I mentioned, there's other regimes out there, anti-corruption regimes, in addition to the FCPA, uh, one that came into existence in the 2010 is the UK Bribery Act. Um, interesting, how the difference is here, one of the things that's important here is that it prohibits active bribery, similar to the FCPA, passive bribery, accepting bribes, failure of commercial organizations to prevent bribery by associated person, persons. Uh, and under the, the relevant UK law, uh, relevant commercial organization I means any company that's incorporated in the UK or under UK law, corporate entities that carries on a business or part of a business in the UK, um, there is an affirmative defense for adequate procedures. But there are some very key differences with the FCPA. The, bri the UK Bribery Act explicitly prohibits commercial bribery. So while the FCPA is focused on bribery of foreign officials, the UK Bribery Act uh, prohibits any kind of bribery, whether it's commercial, whether it's paying to foreign officials, uh, or to you know, independent third companies. Um, there is no facilitating payments exception. There are no regional promotions exceptions. Uh, the adequate procedures as an affirmative defense as opposed to mitigating factor. There are no whistleblower incentives. The scope of indirect knowledge, associated persons versus knowledge standard, um, and there's no books and records provisions unlike the FCPA. There is... Uh, what we've seen over the past four, five, six years is really, initially was the U.S. Uh, taking the lead on the FCPA and, and enforcing the FCPA around the world uh, wherever they could based on jurisdiction of either U.S. companies or non-U.S. companies that had a footprint in the U.S. in some way. Uh, what you're seeing now is many more countries that are involved uh, investigating in anti-corruption uh, in their own countries. The U.S. DOJ recently announced 56 new extradition and mutual legal assistance treaties to bolster international cooperation. Recent U.S. FCP investigation included parallel investigation in numerous forest jurisdictions, including Brazil, China, Costa Rica, France, Germany, Indonesia, Italy, Korea, Nigeria. The names in the parentheses here are companies that, that were in those countries. And what this means is that in these foreign jurisdictions, whether it's Brazil or Germany or Nigeria, the U.S. DOJ and SC were working with authorities in those countries to investigate alleged violations of both the FCPA and local anti-corruption laws. As a, as a key takeaway, as we're winding up here, uh, and we will have a couple of minutes at the end to go over some questions, um, but a major point of emphasis by, emphasis by the DOJ and the SEC the DOJ and SEC will give meaningful credit to a company that implements, in good faith, a comprehensive risk-based compliance program, even if that program does not prevent an infraction in a low-risk area because greater retention and resources have been devoted to a higher-risk area. So FCP compliance risk is a combination of who, public versus private customers, what, large public projects versus producing widgets, for examples, where, the country's corruption reputation, again, this goes back to the Corruption Perception Index, and how. For example, whether the, is the uh, an entity is using third parties and how they're using them. And the DOJ and SC focus on all the variables. So recent FCP enforcement actions instruct that while compliance efforts should focus on high-risk situations, business leaders must be alert to the risk of president in all countries in all situations. 
some of the key compliance touchstones when dealing with FCPA compliance or anti-corruption compliance. Know your customers. Any government agencies, any private entities owned or controlled by the state, uh, any company that's dealing with these example agencies, you should know who these customers are. Marketing initiatives. What sort of entertainment or marketing expenses are being incurred? Go-to-market strategies. For example, any use of third-party agents, distributors. And finally, logistical issues, import export issues, permits, licenses, and certifications. And again, when we're dealing with FCA compliance, when we're advising companies and what to do here, what we tell them is these are the things that you should look into when you're dealing with the FCPA or anti-corruption compliance and what you should have in, in, uh, in place. Finally, some of the FCPA compliance best practices. In light of ever-increasing government enforcement, companies need to implement and monitor anti-corruption compliance programs. Anti-corruption compliance programs can mitigate exposure for a company. So again, even if there's, a, for example, a violation that a company finds at some point, if there's an anti-corruption compliance program in place and it's meant to catch everything um, or attempt to catch most violations and a, there, something happens that's outside of that, having that effective compliance program can mitigate exposure to the DOJ or the SEC uh, enforcement actions. In, in addition, Effective compliance programs can also act as a defense under the UK Bribery Act and as a mitigating factor for purposes of sentencing under the US sentencing guidelines. What, fully what we do for all of you that are on the phone, obviously the, we do these webinars. We, 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 what we do with clients, potential clients, we, we help review existing compliance programs. If no program is in place, we assist companies to prepare and implement compliance programs. In addition, we provide training to employees, uh, and we do this on a regular basis for our clients. Our contact information is, is, is on here. Myself, Jaime Guerrero, uh, my email is on there, as well as Francisco Cerezo. Um, and a copy of the PowerPoint presentation and a multimedia recording will be available on Foley's website within 24 to 48 hours at the uh, website uh, that's listed here. And in addition, we welcome your feedback. If you can, give us back a uh, feedback on the web conference, we would very much appreciate it. Um, we had one question, which I'll answer here, and it regards to obtaining jurisdiction over someone with only a U.S. bank account. Um, the person was wondering if that confers complete jurisdiction or if the amount able to be obtained would be limited to the amount of money in the bank account itself. That's a good question, uh, and, and I can answer very simply. The amount of money is irrelevant. It's the fact of having a bank account in the U.S. loan that would, that would cause and convey jurisdiction by the DOJ or the SEC over that entity. Um, the government's view is any entity that's using um, a bank in the U.S. to conduct any business, whether it's illegal or illegal, um, that is enough to conduct jurisdiction because that, per that company or entity is actually using a U.S. facility. Same with mails. If the mails are used, um, whether it's you know, U.S. mails or, um, uh, uh, for example, Federal Express or DHL or UPS, or even the use of wi um, wire transfers or um, uh, fax machines, Things of that, even using any fax-based number, for example, could, could, could convey jurisdiction. Uh, so the jurisdiction is not limited to, for example, an amount in a bank account. Um, any other questions, I'd be happy to hear it. Otherwise, um, I thank you very much for your time and attendance. I believe we wrapped up in a little bit, in a, at, a, at, a, at an hour exactly. Thank you for your time. Uh, it was a pleasure uh, speaking to all of you, and I hope uh, uh, if there's any other questions, feel free to give me a call or send me an email uh, or send an email or, uh, to Francisco or to uh, or send, give him a call. And finally, you can always reach Jackie Polston for any contact information for anyone else here at Foley and Larger. Thank you very much and have a wonderful day. Thank you, everyone, and we hope to see you on the next webinar. You'll be getting information shortly on that in the next uh, month or so. Thank you. Have a great day.